Okay, um, uh, I'm Mike Beard, and when people ask me what, my, what I do, what my job is, um, it's probably easiest uh, to answer it by saying that I help people and organisations make positive changes. So what we actually do, what I do, is look at um, the bits that really interest me. So what actually goes on in between your ears, the kind of neuroscience bit in terms of behaviour and why we do what we do. Uh, but not just the mechanical bit, how that then relates to what you do as a person, the psychology bit. Uh, and most importantly, especially when you're looking at doing things differently, is how learning occurs and how people can do things differently. So all the work that we kind of do is based on an understanding of you know, what goes on in between your ears when you have your funny five minutes or life becomes a bit wobbly, how that relates to you uh, as being a successful human being, the psychology of it. And then most importantly, what do you actually have to do then if you want to do things different, if you want to make things change? So that's what the kind of work is based on. One of the, um, the things that really interests me in the work that I do with young people and, and parents and adults is, as I've said, what happens in between your ears at those times when things become really difficult. And not just what goes on, but how can you help people understand that? So what they're able to do for just a moment is actually step back from what's going on and recognise that you know, the person is perhaps not necessarily the same as their behaviour. And one of the ways to, um, to help us understand that, which some people find helpful, um, could be this. This is um, an anatomically accurate uh, model of a brain. Um, it's half a brain, it's, uh, it's life size. And bits of this brain are involved in different uh, functions at different levels. And what happens, of course, when we become stressed is that we lose, we literally lose the ability to think more clearly. And that's a really big factor in some of those black or white, I'm right, you're wrong kind of arguments. So one way of understanding uh, this is to think, of, um, to think of our brain or the outside of a head in this way. So if this were the outside of a head, which is why I'm not gonna give up the day job and become an artist. So there's our happy smiley face. Now if we were to look inside the brain, then there's your backbone going down the back. And there's an area of brain function, uh, sometimes called the reptilian brain, uh, because if you're a, a snake or an anaconda or a crocodile or something like that, this is really the major part of your brain. And it's really important, and we've kept it, uh, because it controls some of the really important mechanical things that we don't want to think about. So the fact that your heart beats, for example, and that your lungs breathe, you can balance, walk, move, all that kind of stuff, is controlled pretty much by this. So that's chuntering away for most people, quite happy most of the time, not having to think about that kind of stuff. And the part of our brain which we tend to do our thinking with, although only a tiny part of this is actually involved in thinking, is the bit which actually looks like a brain. So it's the kind of wriggly bit at the top. So if we were to take our model apart, there we have our reptilian brain at the bottom, sitting on top of the spine here. And this is the bit which most of our kind of thinking occurs in, and when we can access this clearly, this is the bit which allows us to be able to see the shades of grey between black and white. To be able to say, well, okay, you know, maybe I could have actually done something differently in that situation as well as expecting you to. So I can see a sense of proportion around this. So when I can think clearly, what it gives me up here is an ability to, to see the bigger picture. And by that I mean I can think across time. I can see, well, okay, that was then, that's the past, this is now, and tomorrow's another day. You know, they're all things possible up here. And as I've said, it gives a sense of perspective and proportion, the shades of gray between black and white. So if we were to look at this metaphorically, let's for a moment imagine that these different areas in the brain are a bit like a kind of an ocean going passenger liner, okay? So here's our boat coming towards us, end on. And here's the sea level. And this is really important, we'll come back to this in just a second. And you've got your reptilian part down here, the mechanical bit, which effectively is doing the job of the engine room down here. So it's really important, you know, without that the, the ship's not actually going anywhere. But the engine room isn't deciding where we're going or why. That's the job of the bridge of the ship. And where consciousness exists, up here, our ability to think, or thought. I can think clearly if the weather's calm, 
and the captain, he or she can say, well, okay, we need to think about where we're going and why and crew levels and all that kind of stuff. So when I'm calm, when I'm relaxed, when I can see clearly, I've got good access to this, I can see the bigger picture, I can think across time, I can put things in perspective. But what we know about the way that our brain works is this. There's a third region, sometimes referred to as the limbic part of the brain, or sometimes the emotional part of the brain down here. And what's really interesting about the way your brain works is that every single piece, every single piece of incoming information, doesn't matter whether you see it, doesn't matter whether you smell it, whether you taste it, whether you hear it, whether you touch it, all of that information is actually rooted through this bit, the bit below sea level, below conscious thought, before it gets up to the point where you might think about it. And in actual fact, we get shed loads of information coming into this part, far more than ever makes it up to see the light of day up here. In fact, it's estimated that you might be getting in excess of two million to four billion bits of information coming into this limbic part of the brain every single second. It's vast. Now clearly, we're not thinking about that all the time, only a tiny amount ever gets it up there. But what happens to all this information coming down here? Well, the first thing that happens is it's compared to what you know already. So the interesting thing is you can hear and see and taste and smell something, and it's made sense of by what you've seen in the past. And this is one of the big issues around communication. I can genuinely see, hear, or think something that to me, based on my past experience, is absolutely true and accurate and honest. And it might be different to yours. And yours might be equally accurate and honest, but it's based on what you know. So the fact of the matter is we can genuinely sometimes be talking about exactly the same thing and actually genuinely hold completely different viewpoints on it. And it's sometimes really helpful to remember that. We don't all see the same reality. So one role of this is to make sense of the world around us. It can be different for different people. It is. It's an estimated, in fact, that only about 20% of the world around us is actually shared in common with other people. 80% is based on our own interpretation of it. And the other thing which happens is it's as if this part here, the limbic brain, operates a bit like the radar room, and this is just a metaphor. And the radar isn't just making sense of all this information, it's also checking it for threat. It's looking out for stuff which is kind of life and death. Now if something comes in which matches something on this list, for example, you know, if a lion came into the room or something, you don't tend to stand there in conversation with the person next to you and say, I wonder where it came from, you know. What happens is, if it's on the list, if it's on the life and death bit, that gets ticked and the limbic brain communicates directly with the engine room to say, right, get out of there, run as quickly as you can or kill it, the fight or flight response. And to do that, the engine room goes into overdrive and we experience some of the things which we typically feel when we're stressed or upset or angry or hurt. Our heart races, our breathing speeds up so we can get lots of oxygen into our body. We start to perspire the clammy hands because running away or fighting is going to make us hot and we need to cool down. But what people sometimes don't immediately recognize is as well as switching on what we do need, this is ruthlessly efficient. It recognizes the situation as being potentially life and death based on past experience. And it also switches off what we don't need. So what do we notice when we're stressed or angry? Well, our tummy can feel a bit unsettled the urge to go to the loo, a dry mouth, because digestion's been shut down. But in terms of communication, not only are we genuinely often seeing two very different versions of the same situation, when we're stressed, as well as the digestive system being shut down, the other part, which is now redundant for the next few minutes, is this bit. We're on autopilot. This is chuntering away quite happily, driving this system. And the same stress hormones which cause our heart to race, which cause our hands to perspire, which cause me to feel sick, those same stress hormones also quite literally shut down information going up to the point where I can see the bigger picture. And so instead of being able to say, hang on a minute, I can see your point, you know, I'm 53 years old, you're 17, the world's a different place, we fall into that black or white, I'm right, you're wrong, end of story. It's my way or no way. Or when we're feeling really anxious, 
We get into the same black or white mindset. It's all my fault. It's hopeless. There's no point. I'm never going to do this. And sometimes when we're either being in that kind of mindset or we're hearing it, it's just helpful to know that although it's really unpleasant, it is temporary. It's not who I am. It's simply levels of emotional arousal have risen. They've shut down my ability to see the bigger picture. My world becomes very black or white. I lose a sense of the future. Really unpleasant, but it will pass. That it will pass. And what can be helpful practically is one, understanding this, is seeing that actually that's a normal function, just perhaps sometimes happening at the wrong time, but also picking our moments. And actually, if we're going to be talking about something which is a bit of a sore point in the past, which has caused some difficulties, let's have a think about how we can talk about that in a way which isn't so readily going to fire it up. Have you noticed, for example, that if you're having a conversation with a partner, sometimes it's more successful if you have a chat where you go for a walk. Why? Because we're side by side. We're heading in the same direction. We're both pointing in the same direction. So non-verbally, we're actually sharing a point of view rather than head to head over the kitchen table. Conversations in cars are great for the same reason. We're both traveling in the same direction, side by side, avoiding that kind of you know, confrontational eye contact. And they're nice safe spaces for a contained point of time to have a conversation and then end it. I'm not in fear of getting stuck in the car and, and the conversation forever and ever. So sometimes, helpful to be able to step back, realize this is normal, sometimes more helpful than others, and just perhaps pick our moments. All right, we need to talk about it. When are we actually going to be most calm so we can both have a conversation with the ability to see more of the bigger picture? And that can be helpful as well.